Um, I am proud to introduce um, uh, Casey Purnell, who's with um, Transforming the Future of Public Health. If there's a place where we need some power and some pride, it's in transformation. So we're excited to hear the latest updates from the Transforming the Future of Public Health project. So thank you, Casey. Take that turn. Thanks. Thank you, Linnell. And thank you, everyone, who allowed us to be here today to give an update. I actually um, attended the same conference last year in Des Moines and gave a briefer update because we hadn't done quite as much at the time. But I'm excited to share some great updates, some great progress. And I will um, leave some time at the end for questions. And um, I'm going to try not to rush. So normally, I am told, you have 10 minutes to cram it all in. And now I have an hour, so <laughs> I'm going to try to switch it up a little bit, so bear with me. Um, so this is the slide we always start with, of course, is our um, beautiful sunset photo. And, and you know, we started this project by setting a vision. And that's the first thing I always start with when I do a presentation to sort of orient everyone to the project and the purpose of it. So we'll get started with our vision statement here. And I am going to read it because I think it's that important. So this is a grassroots initiative that seeks to transform Missouri's public health system into a stronger, more sustainable, culturally relevant, and responsive system that can meet the challenges of Missouri's diverse communities. The initiative does not propose a quick fix, but advocates for long-term system-wide change that will revitalize public health in order to offer every Missouri resident the opportunity for a healthier life. Now, I know that's a mouthful, but it's all important, and that's all included for a reason. And I just want to point out the word grassroots, um, sort of what makes this initiative different than a lot of the other states that are going through a transformative process is that this is a grassroots driven effort. Um, and I'll get into a little bit of the history here about that. Um, first of all, a big thank you to our funders as well. We always want to recognize Missouri Foundation for Health and Health Forward Foundation have come together to fund this effort um, and have put forth quite a bit of money, quite a bit of resources and time has been put into this already and we are so grateful to them. And then um, Department of Health and Senior Services in Missouri also stepped up this year and um, provided some funding and, and really is a great partner as well and we appreciate all of them. So just to uh, bring everybody up to speed, I know some of you are familiar with the effort but I'm going to give a little bit of background. I'm going to talk about what happened during phase one of the project and then what's going on for phase two which has really just kicked off starting February 1st. So uh, background is around 2014, a group of public health leaders in the state came together and started talking about the need to address some of the system challenges in Missouri. And um, of course, that's a big undertaking. And they knew they needed to do a little uh, data collection. And so that's where they started getting some feedback from people. Is there really a need to do this? Is there a desire to do it? How should we move forward? So uh, they did that data collection and to nobody's surprise really, they came to find that funding and resources tended to be the number one issue on top of people's mind is we don't have enough money or resources or people to do what we need to do. And we've been, as Dr. Archer stated, asked to do more with less. And that continues to happen. So this is just a word cloud that sort of illustrates the top issues that came to mind when they were doing their data collection processes early in this process. Uh, the larger the word, the more often it came up. So they took this information um, and decided to form uh, what they called a steering committee. And that steering committee then wrote a grant proposal to these two foundations. and. Um, Luckily, they were funded after a couple of uh, approaches and some discussion. They funded phase one of a transformation project. And that is what we call Transforming the Future of Public Health in Missouri. Um, you may have also heard it called Healthier Missouri, as uh, sort of either way you might hear it. So the first grant year kicked off in September of 2017. And these were the goals associated with that first grant period. The first being to identify public health system stakeholders, leaders, and vision. And the second being to um, align our public health professional organizations in the state. And I'm going to get into the details of this process as we go here. So the first thing we did for goal one, identifying public health system stakeholders, leaders, and vision, was to bring, well, 
identify those leaders and we really were thinking broad when we were doing going through this process so basically anybody who had a, a finger in public health to some degree was going to be invited into this process because like i said we're thinking grassroots we want as many people and as many viewpoints included as possible so that started with what we called a stakeholder convening session and that happened in march of 2018 so just over a year ago now and so when i attended this conference last year we had just held that convening session and that's really what I gave my update on. So now it's been about a year since then. We convened over 140 different system stakeholders from across the state and we were so grateful to have so many people willing to come and give their input. We did a whole day of just data collection from these folks asking them to share with us what they thought the top system public health system challenges were in the state of Missouri. They gave us tons of information and it was fabulous and we were so glad to have them there. We also asked them to help us identify the public health leaders in the state who should be part of an advisory council who would help sort of propel this project forward. So they helped us identify some of those folks. And really it was all about, we want good representation and diversity on this advisory council so that we've got lots of voices being heard. So out of the convening session in March, we learned, we asked them, in, we did this really cool poll, in-person poll at the time, and it was, it was just really neat to see the data come in. But this is what we ended up with here were the top reasons for transformation identified by that convening audience. And those were stable and increased funding, a unified voice for priority issues, and coordination across agencies. Um, I don't think anybody was particularly surprised by those issues being the top, but um, certainly it was good to actually see it coming out uh, amongst the group. And then of course, the other issues that were identified were as, you know, just as important, but they didn't rank nearly as high. So we have higher quality and more consistent operations prior to it, prioritized by elected officials, workforce training, all of these things that you've probably heard or thought about before. So we took this information and assembled it into a report and we sort of shared this with the advisory council. And we formed an advisory council. It was just over 40 people that met in May and June of 2018. And this group was tasked with taking all the information from the convening session about what are our top system challenges and prioritizing that information and basically proposing the next phase of the project. This group, this advisory council was fantastic. They were full of knowledge, uh, lots of experience in the room, and we were so grateful to them for participating in that. Um, and we also brought in a couple of representatives from states who are also doing this sort of transformation work. One was from Washington State and one from Kansas. And uh, again, grateful to have them in the room during those meetings. They provided us some great just general information about what they were working on and how they approached these issues because uh, to no one's surprise, you know, we all have sort of similar issues within the public health system. So we were grateful to learn from them. And so the advisory council ended up basically coming up with a list of recommendations for our steering committee. And um, one, of the, one of the things about this project is you'll hear lots of names of work groups, committees, uh, steering committees. It's just gets a little bit confusing, so if you need clarification, you can ask me, and we have an org chart that I can show you as well. But um, our steering committee turned into our executive committee today, so if you hear me reference the executive committee, its steering committee sort of transitioned into our executive committee. So the advisory council made recommendations to the executive committee. The executive committee decided we're gonna prioritize these certain issues, and we're gonna propose a phase two of this project. So the second goal, so that's the first goal sort of wrapped up from phase one. The second goal was to organize our professional organizations in the state of Missouri to create a unified voice for public health. Um, you know, what they had found was that they'd be going and doing some advocacy or lobbying work for on behalf of public health in the legislature and they would get looks of confusion or, um, oh, you're just another, some public health organization, you know, just another M, M group. Um, and so these groups recognize the need to come together and that a unified voice for public health would certainly be more effective. So these are the groups currently that are serving on this professional organizations group. 
Um, we're grateful to them for, for their willingness to participate. And, um, you know, this group may, the composition of this group may change over time as different organizations become involved. So, so uh, they really accomplished a lot in the first year of the project. They met a total of eight times in a year's period, which is um, pretty fantastic. And when I say they meet, I mean in person for five hours at a time. So we're talking about leaders from each of these organizations meeting eight times in a year for five hours at a time. That's a big chunk of time. And I totaled up the amount of hours, uh, in-kind resources that had been put into this in the first year it was over a thousand hours. And it's just truly amazing that they stepped up and have already put this much effort into things. So um, they, in that time period, came up with a mission and vision statement. The vision statement being united for public health and the mission being leading public health collective impact through advocacy, collaboration, communication, and workforce development. So they got down to the nitty gritty of some goal setting. At the end of the year, we had a strategic planning session and they set goals for the next phase of the project. And so that's what they're working on currently. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. So in addition to the first two goals, we knew, the steering committee knew early on that having a communication strategy was going to be key to any successful transformation project. So they know, not only hired me as a project manager, but they hired a communications coordinator. And her name is Jackie McReynolds, and she's fabulous, and some of you may know her, but um, she does a great job for us. And she really off the bat got us going strong with a communication strategy. and. Um, the goal was to raise awareness and actively engage stakeholders in this process. Like I said, we're talking about a grassroots effort, which means we've got a lot of outreach to do. So we did run into some challenges in the first year of the project in doing that much outreach. Um, and those were, of course, we have a huge audience. You know, Everybody is impacted by public health, so really your audience is everyone. So we had to sort of narrow that down as we went along and um, started working with some more specific audiences, including um, public health staff, uh, administrators, um, state and local, I mean, and some legislative uh, outreach as well. But we narrowed the audience a little bit. Um, and then, you know, we're also dealing with something that's sort of an abstract con concept. So explaining it to people can be difficult. And, you know, if we're honest about it, public health isn't, that you know, defined when you ask somebody off the street, what is public health? Oftentimes, you'll you'll get healthcare or um, doctors, nurses, that kind of stuff, immunizations. You know, they they have a specific thought process about what public health is, and so when you're trying to explain why or what we're doing with this transformation project, it can be really difficult, even within our own system and our own uh, staff. So that was one of our challenges. Um, we had, as I stated earlier, the transformation grant title was really long, so we shortened it to Healthier Mo. This is all part of a branding strategy, as Dr. Archer referred, who during his presentation, branding is so important. That's sort of what we learned along the way, is that we want people to know when we say Healthier Mo exactly what we're talking about. So on that note, before I forget, if you go to our website right now, there will be a pop-up, and we are doing a branding strategy survey and we would like your input on that so please if you have time today or whenever um, healthiermo.org take that branding survey for us it's going to help us move this project forward in our own branding so thank you for that um, we also had a fairly limited budget for communications meaning um, we didn't have money specifically for advertising or anything like that so it all had to be sort of generated in-house and then distributed, distributed by our um, partners. And then we had, of course, the uncertainty of continued funding. We, we were doing a lot of build-up, sharing information, you should get involved in this project without the ability to say, there's going to be a phase two for sure. So <laughs> there's a risk associated with that, and we knew that. And so we were very careful about how we were presenting the information along the way. So. On the other side of things, we also had a lot of communication successes during phase one. Um, there was a lot of buy-in and a lot of feedback generated during the convening session, 
during the advisory council sessions, we found people were really excited to be involved. They were excited to ask if you participate. And um, like I said, we're always grateful to have more folks involved in the process. Um, we gave regular e-updates, very email blasts um, for a while we were doing weekly. Um, I think we're down, we're doing a monthly e-update because we've got a lot of other channels operating now via our Facebook and other things that I'll tell you about in a little bit. But um, we were able to share some success stories because we know, you know, it's not all bad. <laughs> There's good stuff going on in the state and we want to share those successes because we can learn from them and we can, um, you know, it's, it's things that are worth telling and people relate to stories and so we've had a lot of folks who are willing to, to um, let us sh share their stories and we were very appreciative of that. Um, we had, we formed a communications committee which really helped to give Jackie some guidance on how to propel this forward. Um, you know, more minds uh, contributing is always what we want. So um, we also developed an e-module, which is currently available on our website. And I'd encourage you to just check out our website. Jackie does a great job with updating it and putting everything out there that we generate. Um, there's meeting minutes and everything. You can find it all out there. Um, but this e-module in particular was a tool that we felt like could really be the basis for a lot of education about public health in the state and you can we're encouraging people to share it not only with students but if you have new staff that's coming on board and they don't have a basic level of knowledge about what the public health system in Missouri is how it operates this is a great place to start and show them this video so check that out um, we also have a partners and supporters map you can see that map there this, these are folks that have basically signed on to their support of the project, and so we wanted a way to illustrate that. Um, let's see. We've, we're, we're currently coming up with different roles and ways for folks to get involved with the project, um, and we put those out on through our social media channels specifically, and then Jackie is just constantly coming up with new um, tools and things and putting them on the website. Again, I'd encourage you to go out there and check it out. So. The good news is the proposal um, put forward at the end of phase one was funded for, and we were funded for a 24 month period for phase two. And I'll get into a little bit more about um, what this means exactly. Um, but this is sort of the roadmap we have outlined. So again, we've got the top road, which is, indicates our pursuit of the foundational public health services model, and then the bottom road is just a continuation of the work of the professional organizations group. So um, the phase two plan is outlined here. We really have three big goals. Um, we, as I said, are going to pursue foundational public health services model for the state of Missouri. And I'll show you a, a photo, of, uh, image of that model that we're going to base this on. And um, currently, I can give you a status update. We are working to form a work group, we're calling Foundational Public Health Services Work Group, that is gonna serve as sort of a key informant group to help develop the model. The second goal of phase two is to increase stakeholder engagement. Again, we're a grassroots effort. We have to continue to do the outreach and the messaging and to generate the buy-in that we're gonna need to make the changes that are necessary for a transformation. So, um, lucky for us, we get to keep Jackie on board. Um, and we also have a full-time evaluator on staff as well. So, you know, that continuity in staff is really important in, in moving this process forward as well. And then uh, last but not least, of course, is to formalize the public health organization's function and structure. Um, you know, eventually they sort of will become their own sort of standalone organization that can do and promote and advocate and lobby for public health in ways that we as a nonprofit or associated with a grant cannot do. So that is one of their goals. So this is the National Foundational Public Health Services model that I've referred to. Um, this just recently got updated um, and you can find it on the PHNCI website um, with lots of great resources about the model. But this is basically where we're starting from with foundational capabilities and foundational areas from which we think should be a minimal set of standards for any public health department or basically available to any M Missouri resident. So um, as I said, we have this key informant group that's going to be composed of representatives from LPHAs, from the state, 
and from academia that are going to come together, look at this model, figure out how it fits to Missouri's needs and resources, and then tailor it to meet our needs. So that's a process for the first year of that 24-month timeline. The second half of that 24-month timeline is going to be reassembling this key informant group and asking them the question about, OK, now we have a model, but how do we get people to implement the model? How do we adopt the model across the state? So that key informant work group has got a lot of work ahead of them, but um, I trust that they'll be able to handle this. So, um, One of the cool things that's happened recently is we've been invited to join the 21C Learning Community, which is a group of states that is actively working on transformation and the adoption of a foundational public health services model. So um, one of the things, like I said earlier, we invited Washington and Kansas to come and present to us at the advisory council meetings, and they were kind enough to do that. We want to continue to learn from these other states because we don't want to reinvent the wheel. If people are already doing a lot of good work, we can learn from them and sort of adopt. And you know, this is a long process. And if we can shorten it down at all <laughs> from learning from other people, that's certainly one thing we want to do. So, we were really excited to get the invitation to join this uh, learning community, and we're looking forward to participating in that. So also part of phase two is to continue the communication strategies. A lot of what we have been doing, we will continue to do. Um, we've, with the help of that communications committee, we have managed to narrow our primary audiences down. Um, you know, one of our main goals is to continue to grow engagement as we go along, to, to continue to do storytelling. Um, and then, as I mentioned, um, really define our brand and how people recognize Healthier Mo and how they feel about it. And uh, that's why we're doing that survey right now. And then there's a new tool called Phrases that will be um, coming out later this year that we hope to implement as part of our communication strategy. And if you wanted more information, I'd, I'd direct you to Jackie about that. So, also continuing on during the second phase of the project will be the work of the professional organizations. As I said, they have set some goals at the end of phase one. Those goals have been um, adopted by various, we have four work groups now, advocacy, collaboration, communication, and workforce development. Each of these work groups is working sort of independently, and then they report back to the larger professional organizations every other month. Um, and so we've got lots of meetings going on, um, and that professional organizations group of organizations has continued to show um, great dedication and willingness to come together, and, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, but the goals for this year for the professional organizations group for, I should say, for phase two, the next 24 months, is to formalize structure and bylaws, which they're currently working on. They want to increase their collaborative efforts and figure out ways they can work together better. And then they also want to develop an impact plan for the next phase of the project. So as I said earlier, we also um, are lucky enough to have a full-time evaluator on staff. And um, he's a big part of the team, and we're so grateful to have him. And um, he's working on several projects for us, not only doing some outcomes measures you know, some of the basic stuff for evaluation that you would think of, but also doing a lot of process evaluation for us. So one of the things that we are doing is documenting everything that we're doing as we go along in the form of a case study <coughs> in the hopes that what we're doing, other people can learn from. And so we want to make that public. We can share, as, like I said, all of our information is out on the website. If you need something that's not out there, you can let me know. Um, that's one of his key projects is to um, develop that case study, which he did for phase one and will continue on into phase two. Um, we also are doing some what we're calling perceptions monitoring, and that is just trying to gauge how people are experiencing the Healthier Mo initiative. What do they think about it? What does it mean to them? Um, this sort of help us guide our outreach to them. We are also now tracking in-kind contributions. You know, during the first phase of the project, we didn't really think to do that. And then we sort of got to the end, and I thought, you know, as I said earlier, we, we totaled up the number of just hours that had been devoted to that uh, professional organizations group, and we're like, man, we should be tracking that. So um, we're trying to do a better job of tracking all the in-kind resources that are being put into this project for phase two. Um, 
Todd, our evaluator, is also doing um, putting together what he's calling a literature review, but it's really a, a great overview piece of, of the states that have already done foundational public health services work and sort of condensing it and making it applicable to our group, who our work group, our committee that's going to come together and um, start working on the development of this model. It's basically going to be a reference document to look at what's been done in other states and how might that apply to Missouri. And he's nearly got that finished, which is really exciting. Um, and he's also working on a stakeholder commitment and communications model that's specific to the Healthy Remote Project. And it's really pretty exciting because this was sort of developed in-house and we're just now getting some results from our first survey. Uh, so I'll share a little bit more about that with you guys. So um, like I said earlier, what we want and intend to do is make everything that we're doing shareable um, so that everybody can learn from this. And so um, Todd has been great about um, making this easy to understand and shareable information. So what we're doing uh, with the commitment model is basically looking at, we know as a grassroots effort, we're going to have to have lots of buy-in in order to make this work. So we want to measure sort of that level of buy-in as we go along, and we want to move people. We want to see some progression along that scale. And so what we did is this past fall, 2018, sort of developed our own scale for this level of commitment. And you can see it runs everywhere from awareness up to ownership. And you can see the variables that essentially go under each. We have a more detailed version of this if you'd like to see it. So um, the other thing we're measuring is not only their level of commitment, but things that may um, prohibit them from being engaged or committed to the project. And so we're looking at things like skepticism um, and, and do they feel represented in the project? Do they feel like their voice is being heard? We really want to move people along the scale as we go along. We know initially people are, I mean, our first job is to raise awareness about what we're doing, but then eventually we want to push people along to become very engaged and excited about the project. So these are sort of the four levels that we're aiming for, supportive, engaged, committed, and then finally active and really involved in the project. So one of the things we're doing is trying to provide lots of opportunities to participate. Um, we're going to have some regional focus groups coming up, I hope, sometime this summer, spring, summer, um, in which we're going to assemble um, most likely staff, if possible, from our LPHAs at a regional level to give us feedback on this model. Um, and that information will be taken back to the work group to help define the model further. Um, we're doing, as I said, the brand survey right now. We're going to do some brand focus groups as we go along as well. Um, we're doing additional surveys. Like I said, the commitment model um, requires a survey as well. And we just, like I said, we just got our first data back and Todd has run some of the numbers and he um, sent me an email the other day and he was like, I'm just going to be nerdy about this, but this data is awesome. It's going to be so helpful. And I said, I'm really glad you like numbers, Todd, but that's not my thing. <laughs> so um, I'm so grateful to have Todd on board with the numbers. Um, so and we'll, like I said, we're developing some roles, um, other ways for folks to get involved with the project, You know, helping us to share the information out on social media is certainly one of the ways we're asking people to get involved. Um, sharing, continuing to share stories of collaboration, things that are working at the regional and local level so that other people can learn from you. And then, of course, adopting sort of a systems thinking mindset. This is the sort of big picture view of things that a lot, of, a lot of systems change happens you know, at the state or the federal level, but a lot of it can happen at the local level too. And this is where the idea of becoming the chief health strategist is so important, is that we need local, local folks to adopt this I can make a difference systems change level thinking. And so we are promoting that as well. So for those in the room today, there are lots of ways to stay informed on our project. You can go to the Healthy Remote website. Um, we've got Twitter. We just launched Instagram, and we've got Facebook going. 
Um, we are still doing an e-update on a monthly basis. And then, of course, we always want to hear from you. So um, call or email. My contact information is on the website, as is Jackie's. And we are always glad to get your feedback. And um, you know, if you have ideas to share, please do. Um, and so I think I'm going to wrap there and stop and ask if you all have any questions about the project. Yes. I have a question about your partnership or your collaboration with the 21st Century Learning Center. Yes, yes. Will you, will you talk more about that? Because I think my understanding of the, is that the, the federal grant initiative that's kind of blossomed into this larger partnership? Or in, how are you connecting with that? I think that's the question. I'm, I'm unsure how that language is connecting with, edu is it education based and community education based like the 21st Century CLC? Um, funding models were or are or it's so you're right it started as a funding stream that I believe was Robert Wood Johnson funding um, but now is broader than that so it's going to include states that didn't receive that initial funding I believe there were four four states involved initially and it has sort of blossomed from there and, and they've realized oh there's these other states sort of doing the same work and we need to learn from everybody who's doing it. So we're going to bring them all into this sort of community. And to be honest with you, I'm not sure where the funding is coming from for that piece. Um, but part of what they've offered to us, which is just fantastic, is the opportunity to go to um, meetings where we're all going to get together, all these states are going to get together, and share our information with each other. And they're providing the funding for us to be able to do that, which is really fantastic. So does that answer your question? There we go. Uh, just to, to add a little perspective on this, I think is helpful that um, the fact was when the realization for the need for transformation became clearly evident to uh, a number of folks came with the reality that there are 114 different local public health agencies in Missouri, now 113. Um, the reality was they were not coordinated. They were effectively standalone local public health agencies. Services were provided in one health department and an adjacent county health department, uh, geographically adjacent. The services or the extent of services was drastically different. The support for public health was drastically different. Very, um, very frustrating, obviously, to um, I'm sure folks at the state, but also to those local public health agencies that the capacity in each one of the geographic areas of the state was so abysmally underfunded and um, fragmented. And it was upon that reality, reaching that reality and saying, you know what, the system that we have was, 18, was created in 1878 and it had not been modified much since then. And the system, that is, the laws, the um, structure, et cetera. And it needed to be updated. It needed to be transformed. And it needed to be uh, reinvented, if you will. So I just wanted to add that perspective that it was out of that sense of frustration that I know other states have experienced as well. And the reality that uh, there was need for update. Uh, and I think it was critically evident in Missouri. So I just wanted to add that. Thanks, Bert. Bert was one of the original steering committee members, so he has the long-term perspective. I'm old. <laughs> well, I don't remember. I wasn't there in 1878. <laughs> Thank you, Bert. Hello. Hi. So my question is, it sounds like the stakeholders that you're bringing together are professionals who are providing public health services. Is there any direction to get feedback or input or involvement from those who are receiving public health services? Because I know you said you're capturing success stories. Mm -hmm. um, I would imagine sometimes that's coming directly from the professionals who are providing the services versus those who are being served. 
this microphone is dying, so I'm just going to try to speak loudly. <laughs> um, yes, and so we considered even for phase two having the general public as one of our target audiences, but when we thought how broad that is and what a big what a big task that would be, it sort of was outside the scope of what we felt like we could do over the next two years. But we feel like the public is clearly an audience as they're receiving the care and the services that we need to tap into um, and eventually we will do that. We just sort of have to do it in a stepwise fashion and so we aren't quite there yet but certainly that's on our radar and you know I think as we collect stories there may be opportunities to speak directly with people who are receiving services um, and we intend to do a lot more of that storytelling this second phase of the project we're even going to have some video stories created so there will probably be some folks who have received services included in those video stories I would imagine yeah okay, so you have the, of the states that have been through a public health transformation process do you have a sense of which one maybe was the most dramatic change or can you Tell us what they did. Yeah, so some of them are. Repeat the question. Yeah, um, he asked which of the states that are sort of going through a similar process, which states can have had some dramatic change, um, and what can we learn from them? Um, great question. Uh, so we brought in Washington State because they're fairly different than us. Um, they don't have 114 counties. They have, I think, they have 12 jurisdictions and. Um, they're still locally organized, but um, they are, I want to say, oh, nearly 10 years into this process, and they've learned a lot as they've gone along. Um, specifically, they've had a lot of success in generating legislative support and some funding from the legislature to help push their process along. And then there are other states who have also gone um, and got a, gotten sort of um, policy or mandated help from their legislature to help push the process along. And I'm not suggesting that that's what we're going to do, but those are certainly some big change areas where they've had a lot of success. Um, and then we've learned a lot from Kansas as well. Like I said, they attended our advisory council meeting and they're very similar to us in structure in that they have, I think, 110, and somebody from Kansas can correct me, but 110 local health agencies. <laughs> and Yeah, um, so very similar structure. Um, they are um, sort of like Missouri in that it's locally organized and um, lots of rural counties. And so we can learn a lot from their approach as well. And they're not 10 years ahead of us, but maybe two years ahead of us in the process. So we can learn a lot from them. Um, and then really, to be honest, becoming part of this learning community has introduced me only in the past few months to a whole new set of states that I need to dig into and start looking at a little bit more deeply. Um, for instance, Kentucky is on the radar. Um, Texas, Ohio, you know, the whole map of them. So um, we intend to spend a lot of time diving in and looking at what other folks are doing to learn from. Sorry, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Yeah. The other mic is dead, so. Um. Yeah, one of the things about the state of Washington is they've had the longest uh, acting, or uh, not acting, but director for uh, their health department that was a local, uh, Mary Selecti, was there for 16 years, crossing two different parties of governors, uh, and then they have a current uh, director there who also was a local, so they've been blessed with that type of continuity for a number of years. Um, the Ohio model that you mentioned also, and under the uh, National Public Health Accreditation Board, uh, this innovation group that's heading up this project is a subsidiary of our board, and so we've been um, tracking all of this. Uh, the Ohio experience has been particularly interesting because uh, they had the challenge of uh, 150 plus local health departments, um, and they've gotten that down to about 100 now in our uh, able to strengthen and consolidate some of their local health departments, which is uh, making those departments more able to do the 10 essential public health services. And so 
yeah, there's a lot of neat models out there that we're kind of trying to figure out what can we take from each different model and uh, improve on. Yeah. And you would know maybe better than I do, Dr. Archer, about Ohio really um, grabbed onto the idea of accreditation as sort of the the bedrock of what they wanted to do. And so they've pursued that and, and have learned a lot, I think, from that experience. Probably something we can learn from as well. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands, but you, of course, come talk to me afterwards if you have questions um, or thoughts or feedback. We're always glad to hear your, hear your suggestions. So thank you, everybody.